Hi, and welcome to the Painting with Commentary Mind Flayer Review and Tutorial from Paint a Life Episode 67, where we painted the Frameworks Mind Flayer. Now, before we get into this, I would suggest you go check out the story episode first. It has the Mind Flayer lore, lots of anguish, intensity, disembodied brains. It was fun. It's very exciting if you like Dungeons and Dragons, so check it out here. The link is up at the top or in the description below. Here's a list of paints that I'll be using in tonight's episode from the Citadel line you can pause and take a gander at. Also, thanks to WizKids for sending me the early access box of the new line of Frameworks miniatures. I'm not paid or sponsored by WizKids in any way, and the opinions stated in my videos are unbiased and my own. This picture of a Mind Flare from 5th edition's Dungeons and Dragons was the inspiration for my color scheme, and I think it might have been the inspiration for the model as it has these flowing robes that look like rag types, etc. This video is going to go through the process of assembly, preparation, painting of the Frameworks miniature. And I'll give my final review at the end of what I thought of the particular product. So these are the pieces that come with this particular Frameworks model, including that little bonus Intellect Devourer, who I didn't use in my story but will cover nevertheless. So getting it out of the box, pretty straightforward and simple. The Frameworks models has the different color packaging like the Nozzle's Marvelous Miniatures, blue singles, yellow doubles, uh, multi-packs that are orange, fat packs that are also orange, the big boys. I might have gotten double and fat pack confused, but it doesn't matter. You'll see them when you see them in the store. And then of course they have their Ultra model, which I didn't have one for review purposes, but I'm sure that's gonna be the most expensive one um, with lots and lots of different sprues. So inside the box, this particular single pack, there's just one thing of sprues, unprimed of the poly, polystyrene material uh, that these particular minis are known for. They come with little plastic plinths, the clear, and I don't know why instead of black, except I imagine if you were to mount the model on a clear and then use it on a combat mat, you'd be able to see. So if it was a snowy mat, you'd see the snow from beneath. And I think that might be why they decided to go for that. But otherwise, really good quality and a couple options on there. So now, we're gonna cut these out. Using our hobby snips, if you've never worked with um, minis before um, that come on a sprue system like this, you're gonna need a pair of snips. If you get snips that have an angled edge like these ones, these are from Citadel, but you can get them from any hobby store. You can also get them from any tool store. Just make sure that the flat edge of the snips is butted up against the part. That is because when you snip it, like the scissoring action, you don't want it to deform the plastic as you've bitten into it. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of chunky left behind, as it was in the case in here. You can just use the snips to take off a bigger piece of it. And of course, we're gonna clean them afterwards. Um, so you don't have to do the snips for that, but be careful that you snip where the sprue meets the model and not the model itself. I know that sort of sounds like it goes without saying, but in practice, especially if you're unsure of what you're looking at, you could be cutting off a finger of a small hand. Again, in some of these cases, these pieces are really small. And if it's got fingers and you know the thumb is connected to the sprue, you might very well chop the boy's uh, thumb off in the process of freeing him from his uh, sprue prison. Also for things like these skulls, make sure you put your finger atop it when you're snipping it off so it doesn't go flying off, uh, which I'm gonna talk about in the assembly part of the video. But in this case, just gently put my finger on it when I snip so that it absorbs some of that energy and prevents it from flying across the room. All in all, if you've ever assembled a Warhammer Mini or anything on sprues before, like a model kit, this part should be common sense. But if you're new to it, take your time, and there are some instructions that come with it, and these parts are labeled on the on the uh, sprues themselves, A, B, C, one, two, three. So it'll help you know what you're looking at and what you're cutting out. Now, clean. Once you've cut out all your pieces, you're gonna have a little pile and every area that the, um, 
model was attached to the sprue is going to have a little burr. So using an X-Acto knife, you can clean that little sprue mark. I suppose you could use it or a mold line remover to clean mold lines, but I didn't find that there were too many mold lines in the mind flayer anyways. But see, as I'm filing off here, there are where it was connected to the sprues, these little burrs, and you use a sharp hobby knife to trim those off. Now, um, something that I've heard other YouTubers talk, YouTubers talk about is using the backside of that hobby knife, where it's not as sharp, but it's still hard, and you can use it to scratch the plastic quite nicely to get off the burr. Um, if you use the sharp side of the knife like I am, especially on things like those robes, you're liable to, to catch and hook and it will bite in and dig down into the plastic and you'll end up shaving off part of the actual model itself, not just the part you're trying to remove. I'd also suggest you wear safety gloves when using these. Um, I don't because I have lizard hands, so I'm immune to blades. I have slashing resistance. I'd also remind you to be careful that you don't destroy or lose any of the little pieces because there are only enough in the pack for the model with none to spare. And funny I should mention that because as I said earlier, while I was working with these tiny little pieces, as you see my pile up there in the top right hand corner, I made the mistake of dropping one. And that is the carpet from the 1960s under my chair in my workroom. What a horrible thing. Look at me on all fours trying to find this damn product and when I finally did, I was like Gollum of Lord of the Rings after 20 minutes finally found it. My precious. So take a second and make sure that you have a nice hard floor underneath you or a carpet or something that's clean in advance so when you invariably drop a little teeny piece, your hide and seek mission goes, you know, without driving you crazy. Now I had an Avengers Assemble clip here, but Disney's lawyers called me, threatened to sue, so I had to take it down. Assembly, when we look at these little parts here, the Mind Flayer's head, there are little divots and rounded edges to help aid in the assembly. As you can see, this headdress has support for two of the heads, and I'm using plastic glue um, because this polystyrene will actually accept and support plastic glue as opposed to just super glue. Now, I had originally using these alligator clips to hold it and using tweezers and it was a pain in the ass. And ultimately I just used my fat fingers. But the important part here and the takeaway is that the plastic cement will actually melt this plastic and on both sides. And when you hold it for 30, 30 seconds to a minute, it will actually ah, see how it fell off and I'm like F this. But again, if you watch here, when you put a little dab of the plastic cement on and then, or the plastic glue and hold it and squeeze it and hold it for 30 to 60 seconds, you're going to have a bond that's almost like a plastic weld and that's perfect. So it's also permanent. So make sure you line up those lobes on your intellect devourer perfectly because if you don't, you're going to have a bit of a problem later. But yes, I much prefer using the plastic cement over super glue while assembling the frameworks. Now the whole point of frameworks is the customizational options in addition to um, them being on sprues and unprimed. But for me, the Mind Flayer was almost a no-brainer. Those robes with those tattered like ribbons were perfect and I had no intention of switching to the skinny little scrawny alien looking hands that the other options were. Uh, it was a no-brainer. So my mind flare looks very much like the box art. As you can see with the plastic cement, a fix, line it up, hold. The longer you hold, you're gonna see the plastic start to melt and make little strands. And again, if you've assembled Games Workshop uh, Warhammer before, you're used to this. If you're new, uh, Pardon the focus on some of the parts in this video. If you're new to using plastic cement or minis that you're assembling, don't rush it. Hold it firmly, but not so hard that they slide and fly out of your hands. Just long enough so that it gets tacky. And then find a spot where you can lay it or set it. You know, how do I set this? 
so that it doesn't fall off. Like right now, it's very weak. It's still somewhat poseable. Um, you can see it kind of moving under my finger there. I don't want it to dry or, or land, and this one doesn't stand up, so I conveniently lean it against something. And now here we are later, and I'm putting the head on with a dab again of plastic cement and affix my Mind Flayer sculpt head. Even though I went with a standard pose, I did take the brain, which was meant to be held in one of the other hands, and I just glued it into his right hand on the palm. So there you go, some kit bashing is very possible with these, especially with the plastic cement. And here were the leftover pieces that I didn't use, those two scrawny little arms, Mind Flayer head, and a it's time to prime. Here you can see in this picture the unprimed um, Frameworks Mind Flayer in the center, beside two Nozzles Marvelous Miniatures pre-primed PVC plastic bendy boys. Um, yeah, I just put that there for uh, uh, so you can compare them. So I'm using a little bit of black in my airbrush. Um, usually I prime with a rattle can. This time I tried my airbrush. I didn't really like the results I got. It's probably my own fault. Next time I do my next framework, I will use the rattle can instead of my airbrush. I think my airbrush settings weren't tuned properly or I had a little too much thinner. It just went on very kind of spackily, but I would definitely suggest a Zenithal Prime, which is where you prime it black and then add some um, white because it really makes those details pop out, as you can see here. Uh, makes it much easier for print uh, painting the details later. But as you can also see, my prime is not very smooth, so rattle can for me next time. Now it's time to paint. One of the first things I did here was take all of my colors that I was going to base this with and put it on my homemade wet palette um, just so that I had them all easily accessible. And I'm going to start with some Eshin Gray. Now a couple of things I'm going to cover right now. I'm going to go through all the grays I did in this headdress. Eshin Gray, Skaven Blight Dinge, Dawnstone, Administrative Gray, and White. Okay, here come the, the color swatches. I did this, I know it's a metallic. I'm not gonna say I was trying to do non-metallic metal, but I was trying to do non-metallic. No, I'm kidding. It, it did end up being flat paints all the way around. No metallics. I used only one contrast paint and I didn't use any um, contrast paints to, cut, to, to paint. I just used base paints and layer paints. I was trying to respect the details of the frameworks miniature that were in front of me by painting like a little bit more I don't know how do I say this without making it sound like I'm disparaging myself I'm not the greatest painter I'm not a shit painter but I'm I have where I have ways to go in my development I like basing and I like making videos a week, every week or two and ergo I don't have 40 hours to work on one arm and get a photorealistic coloring I'm still learning how to wet blend. I'm still learning how to properly dry brush and use contrast paints, but I do enjoy every time I paint. And if you're in the same boat as me for that, congratulations, you're doing it right. With that said, I didn't want to use metallics on this one and I didn't want to use contrast paints. I wanted to try and see what I could do with just paints on the details, as I've said. Um, and you know, when you see the finished product, you'll see how that turned out. Hence the five grays and white that I've used on this headdress and his armor. Now with that, his name is Drusus, by the way. If you saw the story video, that's the Mind Flayer's name. The point I'm trying to make though is I didn't really film my application of all those grays. Just know that I kind of layered them on and I was also using a new brush, which wasn't very good. I thought it might be good. It didn't turn out to be good. I have some better brushes. I'm gonna keep working to get better at painting, especially on the Frameworks line. And without going on too much of a rant, let me explain. These Frameworks minis are very small, the singles especially. Look at the size of that Mind Flare. It's literally like two inches tall. It's small. The details, are not globbed up by primer like the Nolzers, but even when I painted Nolzers, I didn't usually paint the tiny ones. I've done a couple episodes with tiny ones and Reaper Bones and Nolzers. Most of the time I paint, paint the bigger ones, right? Like I like the monsters and I have a couple Frameworks monsters I'm gonna to paint too, but they are definitely small. I wouldn't say they're necessarily beginner friendly, being as small as they are, but um, I think that they're very good to push yourself. So, 
I also filmed this without using time lapse. You might have noticed if you've been watching Paint to Life, and this video is just coming through in real time. Now don't worry, it's not going to go on forever. Um, but that also kind of threw me off on how I was going to narrate this. But as you can see, I didn't catch all the grays I used here, but I just started with a dark one, and then I, I worked progressively lighter, moving closer to the tops of the armor, to where I ended it with white. And the white was way too bright for a creature from the Underdark, so then I had to, to thin it out a little bit by adding, not thin it out, but darken it by adding a light, um, watered down eschen gray on top of it just to, to mute that super high white highlights we'll get back to that later in the video i just want to comment on that why this video is in real time instead of time lapse and um let me know in the comments below if you prefer this real time paint or if you prefer the time lapse where you get to see everything as opposed to just seeing parts of it in real time um so yeah let's move on to the next section of the mini So, this Mind Flayer's sleeves and robes underneath those bandaged floating things are like a deep blue. So I'm using a Night Lord's blue as my deep undertone. It's very similar to the gray at a glance at this early in the stage. And because this is the, you know, I always say paint from the inside out. You start with something closest to the core and move your way out. All these bandages and tendrils are overlapping. It's a little bit of a maze. I'm going to paint his arms, his sleeves, with this Night Lord's blue. And then I'm going to paint his robes in between some of the higher bandages that are flowing. The detail on this miniature is so intense that this blue sleeve has bandages about to hit it there. You can see to the right. And then at the thing's wrist, it actually has the slit where you can see a pink wrist, like where the cuffling would be of the shirt. It's hard to explain. I don't have a good shot to show you, but the detail was incredible. And I felt like I wasn't doing it justice as I slapped paint on. But the finished product for me was a step in the direction of challenging myself to grow as a painter. So I was very happy for that. The Mind Flayer skin starts with a Gene Steeler purple as the base coat. Um, <clears throat> It's a nice mid-range between the pinks that I'm going to use for the highlights and the deeper areas that I'm also going to paint on uh, to try and achieve some of the contrast I would get with a contrast paint. So typically I would just splash contrast paint on there to get that effect. But this time I started with Gene Steeler purple, then I used a different darker purple to draw almost like pigment spots and splotches. And then I used a watered down Gene Steeler purple on top of those dark to make it look like it's a pigmentation difference rather than a spot, if that makes sense to you. And when everything was said and done, I'm sure that would have worked for someone with more ability. For me, it just, what it did was make that face not look like a purple Grimace or a, a Thanos. You know, it, it did definitely have different colors as a flesh would. And normally I would have achieved that, like I said, with just some contrast paint or shades over top, but that's how I did it in the finished version of this particular mini. Basically you have his face, some hands, wrists, and feet that are dangling out from the robes to cover with coverage while you're painting. He, they also have extremely long fingers, which wrap around that uh, vertebrae staff. So um, have fun with painting those. It's actually quite, detailed and I appreciated that. I know some people have a thing for feet. Do you have a thing for feet? What about Mind Flayer feet? If you have a thing for feet, you'll enjoy painting the feet. All right, now onto the robes. This is Thunderhawk Blue, a new paint that I just got, and I was excited to try, and I thought it looked kind of like that source picture from the beginning, like a good place for the lighter area of blue to be. Um, I'm brushing it on. I haven't done any of the inside robes yet. I kind of messed up. I was so excited to just move, keep moving forward that you can see there's no deep blue in there. I'm gonna have to come back at it later, and you might think, hey, but GMA Tank, you said to paint the inside first. I do and I messed that up. But this is just going on all over the place. 
on top of the robes on his back and then we'll go into the underneath and I think it's about here that I realized dang should have done those inside areas first but Thunderhawk blue for the win. Case in point, as you see, as I'm applying the inside blue now, it's getting on top of the outside of the robes, covering up some of the Thunderhawk blue, which means now I have to paint over that again. It's exactly what I was saying. And that's why we start with the inside out. And that was a boner that I had to fix. All right, some Wraith bone for that bone staff. How original, but I mean, yeah. Wraithbone with Skeleton Horde is like an easy I win button for painting bone unless you want to be like clever or better. There's some, um, that's not a mistake there. There's some robe that covers the staff there. One of those um, tendrils of Thunderhawk blue. Very cool, by the way. I thought it was very, um, for immersion, it was great to have the robe kind of swaying over top of the staff. That was great. Um, in case you're wondering how fragile is that mini it's not remember that plastic cement i used earlier those arms are on there I and mean, you you could pick them up by the arm and swing them around it's not going to break uh it will crack before it breaks there i mean i'm not brent from Coopertown hobbies i'm not a phd in chemistry but i'm pretty sure that those plastics have molded back together but for now let's uh keep painting this with wraith bone and um let's add some contrast paint to it to bring out the details but I guess we're gonna put some Galvormac red on his sash first. It makes sense. I forgot this is not time lapse. This is real time. I've been cutting the footage down to make the video concise. But I mean, that wraith bone on that vertebrae staff is still wet as I'm painting this sash, and I'm not used to that. It makes sense why I would move off to something else to let that dry fully. So this is a pretty cool burgundy kind of red. I just wanted to uh, apply it to that sash, and we'll touch it up later. I don't think I cover it in the video, but I used the pink horror as an accent around the edges of the sash just to give it like a lighter um, area. And that's mostly because it was already on my palette anyways, um, but it worked out in the end. Now I've only done a couple nevers of med school, but I'm pretty sure you didn't know that your brain is actually word bearers red when it's got blood in it. You always see brains, they look like pasty, you know, flesh. That's because they're drained of blood. When it, if you popped your skull open and looked at your brain, word bearers red for sure. And that's what I'm doing. Also, I didn't really highlight the intellect of our, I think I'd touch on it later because he's kind of a bonus piece. I think they just needed to add something to the spruce, but I painted the brain of the intellect of our, the same technique that I'm painting the brain in Drusus's hand. So now while we're waiting for all that to dry, I'm gonna use some Phoenician purple and mix it with our Gene Stealer purple to make a different purple. I mentioned this earlier uh, for layering, you know, for buildup. When you have a buildup, you want layering to make it brighter, but you also want the dark sections to be darker. Um, so I'm going over top with like a watered down mix. Um, I'm going on top of the head and kind of on the back side of the tentacles leaving the front gene stealers and then we'll break that up again later with the pinks as well as some more uh, gene stealer if I want to bring back some of the original color and again sorry about the focus quality of this particular part of the video I just checked my textbook from doctor class it wasn't just word bearers red it also your brain is also pink horror word bearers red and pink horror is what your brain looks like this is not a dry brush, this is wet, a very light watered down pink horror dragged on top of that word bearer's bread. Bread? Nice. Wonder bread. There's a lot of contours on that brain and a nice pinky on the top showcases those colors. So now I'm doing some layering with blue horror on top of that Thunderhawk blue. I didn't film much of it though, or maybe I'm missing a clip because you'll see in this next snap as we go to do some um, contrast paint, see his right arm, see all the light on top, that's the layering with the blue horror. So sorry I missed that. 
But now we're using the skeletal bone on top of the wraith bone staff as I promised we would. Um, again, contrast paints, they're great for beginners. See if you're new to this, see how one pot of contrast paint will like a wash settle in those creases much darker than the raised areas and we're even going to touch those raised areas up later with a little bit of layering as well um, if you only have enough money to buy three contrast paints skeleton horde is definitely one of them you should get in my opinion especially if you paint lots of undead or bones and most things have bone one way or another it's just great it's a great go-to it also works like an earthy color you know you can use that as a leather or dirt if you're doing basing Skeleton Horde was the first contrast paint I bought in the line. So I'm going to apply that on there now and let it dry and then we're going to come back and give that staff some love. But before I move off of this, notice how it's pooling up. You do want it to pool in the recessed areas, but you don't want too much. You don't want it to, if it's to see how much I have there, I'm going to come back to that because that's too much. It will dry like a black or like a really dark brown line. So see, I use my brush to I'm touching it and see I'm using I'm pushing down I'm like suck that up I sucked it away so now it's mostly gone and if you have to wipe your brush off on a paper towel uh, to get most of the um, contrast paint off and then come back at it with a drier brush and it will absorb some of those pools so you don't have that accidental brown line that's gonna stain your mini I also just heard on um, a channel recently oh yeah Goobertown Brent's uh, Goobertown hobbies you know not not to use contrast paints with your good Kalinsky brushes now not all of you have Kalinsky brushes I particularly I have this is my contrast brush I use this for all contrast jobs and shades I'd suggest you do the same because apparently as Brent was saying in his video it gets up inside the ferrule and, and causes the bristles to split so you're going to use contrast paints or shades make sure you have a dedicated contrast brush for it just so you protect your good brushes and that doesn't mean you have to have expensive brushes to want to protect them nothing like spending nine bucks on a synthetic brush just to have it split apart and fray after only a couple paint jobs okay so here's our mini ready to be layered it's all base it's got a little bit of layering on the headdress and on top of the robes but there's more to do these are base colors that we're gonna start to layer with now so probably not the most important but a little bit of katie and flesh tone gently with a small brush on top of the um convolutions of the brain that's cool because remember Dr. A Tank told you earlier that when the brain is full of blood, it's nice and uh, word bearers red as well as pink horror. But as it drains of blood, which would be closest to the surface, it would be that gross fleshy color that you're used to seeing in science labs. Hence the Cadian flesh tone to help delineate that differential. Big words are big. Next up, we're going to be highlighting the Mind Flayer skin with some Fulgrim pink along the tentacles, along the tops of his hands. Uh, I'm gonna apply this. I'm gonna do a bad job of it. Too heavy handed. Um, again, practice makes perfect. But um, anything you make a mistake for, you just have to touch up and that's the way we do it. And that's what I'll do. But anywhere, the tops of his hands, where the light's gonna hit the topmost or the uh, raised most surfaces, you wanna give a nice highlight for. Fulgrim pink is like a really, really neon kind of pink. I even put a dab of white on top of it, as I told you earlier I did with the headpiece. I had to undo that because the white was way too bright or my hand was too heavy and I put too much on it. All right, time for some more blue horror. I thought I missed this part earlier when I talked it through, but here it was. This is what I'm using to highlight the tops of these robes that are on top of the darker ones. Definitely at the arms, and the top of his arms is gonna have the most, and then the edges of the robes down below will catch the light and have an edge of blue horror. Both his right arm and left arm respectively. And uh, I guess the only thing I'd comment about it is it is an underdark creature, probably shouldn't have this much light bathing on it, but the details of the mini required some like some some act to make them stand out and that's what I chose to do. 
Now that bone staff looks awesome with that contrast paint, but it would look even better if we use some Screaming Skull to clip the vertebrae that are raised the highest. So I'm actually going to use some Screaming Skull on tops of them and some Wraith Bone on top of the topmost part of the Screaming Skull, which is going to be demonstrated here. And when that's done, that'll look like a really cool spinal column. As I mentioned earlier, using white on top of your topmost edges is always good. You know, some of the best mini painters out there say, you know, having that contrast, always have some white and black in your uh, paintings. So here's my GMA tank throwing some white on. And <laughs> it looked like he was being electrocuted. You know, the tops of his arms got white, the tops of his shoulders got white, the tops of the uh, headpiece got white. And at the end of the day, it just looked I don't know, like he was glowing at a techno rave. So how do you fix that once you've ruined your paint job so far? You go to the shade below, you mix up some gray with extra water and you paint that watery gray on top of the white. And what that does is it kills that shine that is too bright. So I did the same thing with his arm. So I needed to use some blue horror water down to put a little bath on that and bring down some of that intensity. Now, just a small bit, right out of the pot, some Wild Rider Red. Uh, these things have glowing orange eyes in my story. So, you know, with the hands of a surgeon, put a little drop of Wild Rider Red into the eye socket, followed by a dab of white for the pupil. Um, the mini can support it, you know, unlike some of the mussy minis we have out there that don't have the details to support this kind of work. This really does, that thing has a pupil or like a ball inside its eye socket for its eyeball. And if you have the patience and the chutzpah to get it, you know, Godspeed. As I mentioned, one of the um, customizability parts of the Mind Flayer was this little teeny intellect devourer. Too small to be sold as its own miniature, but it comes along with Mind Flayers. I didn't use it necessarily in the story and I completely forgot to prime it. So I'm just painting straight on the plastic, but because it's not really being used other than just as, you know, like an adder, that's gonna be okay. I'm basically priming it with the uh, Word Bearer Red to start and I'll treat the brain just like I did with before. A quick wet brush of Pink Horror and some Cadian Flesh Tone on top and then his feet. Because I wasn't showcasing the Intellect Devourer, I didn't record any footage of me painting the feet, but here are the paints that I used. Steel Legion Drab to start, just for the base coat of them. Then there was some Talaran Sand. Ooh, look at that, I got it. Talaran Sand to build up on that. And the highest point of brown, I used some Baylor Brown to give it that yellow kicky, uh, that yellow kicky splash. So there he was all finished up while I was basing the Intellect Devourer and the Mind Flayer as I was preparing to base him too. Okay, so for basing, I decided to use an acrylic rod. I don't know what size it was, but I got it from Green Stuff World. I have some on deck. I snipped myself an acrylic rod. I like the idea of this Mind Flayer levitating. Now I'm mentioning this, this is not supported. It didn't come with the pack. That rod is third party. Um, and I'll show you here, I was trying to use the plastic cement to glue the rod to the PVC, no, it's not PVC, it's polystyrene plastic. That's the Frameworks plastic. So here I am messing around with my plastic cement and plastic glue. Uh, short and sweet is plastic cement does not adhere acrylic to um, polystyrene. As much as I really wanted it to melt and fuse and get that super hard weld, it just didn't. So despite in this video, I switched to Gorilla Glue and got a good bond. But as you see here, as I'm holding it, holding it, pressing down hard, pressing down hard, it just would not melt the acrylic to melt and gel with the um, polystyrene. So Gorilla Glue it was. 
So now that I got that worked out, a little bit of Damonette Hide Purple for the base coat of this plastic base. Um, that's my underdark purple, I suppose. Then I'm going to use some tasty white glue. Oh, get back here. Sorry about that. Then I'm going to use some tasty white glue and some black battleground from Army Painter to put a little bit of speckling on this base and uh, some magenta moss mix from Green Stuff World to give us kind of like an underworldly coat. The base on this is really small. It's meant it gets glued onto that clear base that we saw earlier. So there's gonna be no fascinating basing here. The biggest thing I did, as I showed you before, was that, that acrylic rod, which is gonna be installed next, in the next segment here of the video. Now, believe it or not, I cannot work a drill and hold a camera at the same time, but you can see I started and slowly but surely started drilling, putting a little bit of pressure, a little bit of heat, started biting away at the bottom of the mine flare, continued, 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 until I started making progress. Went slow though, I didn't want it to jam all the way through and break it, but I had a hole big enough that that acrylic rod, as you can see in that picture, fit right up my man's bum. And that was it. Okay, time for my final review of the Frameworks Mine Flare. Ease of assembly, give it four tanks out of five. There were some small pieces, but nothing too terribly tiny. I tried using clamps and tweezers, but ultimately I was able to do it with just my chubby fingers. I used plastic cement, and the finished product is very resilient to dropping and breaking as a result of it. For customization options, I give it two and a half tanks out of five. There weren't tons, to be honest, mostly because I thought the flowing robes were already so epic, why would you ever just use those bare arms? The hands were designed to be holding things, but I just affixed the brain to what I wanted in his open palm anyways. And the leftovers will be used one day in my kit bashing pile, so that's good. I'm not a fan of the open tentacle mouth, and I wanted to be. Compared to the 3D render, they were just way too small, and they weren't detailed enough for me. But again, that spiral staff, spiral? Spinal staff was balls awesome. Also, the mini supported being drilled, and my acrylic posts went in, so I got them levitating, which was pretty cool. Now, for the cool factor, five out of five tanks. A very exceptionally cool finished product. Uh, was tiny, but it is scaled for 28 millimeters, as it should be, and it's sized perfectly for that on the table. Um, the, tiniest bon the tiny bonus intellect devourer was a great touch, which I appreciated. So very cool looking model. Overall rating, four tanks out of five. For my first Frameworks Mini, it was a win. It was easier painting the details on the Frameworks Mini instead of Nolzer's. I do agree that the line is designed for an intermediate painter, not so beginner friendly, unless you're not worried about the cost. What I mean by that is the details on these minis are epic. The eyes, the vertebrae, the contours of the brain, the armor, for example. But if you're a neophyte and don't have the brush control to take advantage of those details, they get painted over and lost. That said, customizing the pieces will be my favorite part of Frameworks for sure. And I can't wait to get at the bigger models, which, while more expensive, will be more forgiving to paint than the single pack ones, and thus will have more value. So that's it for the um, Mind Flayer Frameworks miniature. Here's some of the finished pictures of him on my rotary. You can see the, ooh, that's bright, but you can see all the edging on the robes. Um, that almost looks like his spine, the way that's angled there. Very cool. You can see the finished base with that magenta moss to try and give it like an underdark kind of feel. So I hope you enjoyed this. If you do, please like, share, subscribe uh, to my channel, ring the bell to get notifications when I put out new videos. I'll be working on another Frameworks miniature for next week. Um, don't know which one yet, but I'm gonna go pick it out right now. Again, thank you for spending the time with me. I hope you enjoyed this. Leave a comment below. I'll respond to all of them as I always do. Thank you again. I'm GMA Tang. Wash your hands, people.